but I'm going to tell a quick three stories here of what's going on in Washington, D.C. right now. We have three storylines going, and um, this, this one's kind of interesting because Washington, D.C. moves in bursts, and I actually had this uh, presentation finalized, and then the president saw his world unravel around him over the past couple of weeks. So um, while denial is where we're going to start, um, there have been some early openings in, in this changing. So um, after the Supreme Court came down with their decision, uh, I know uh, Congressman Langford in particular actually didn't show up into the office for a full week. Um, other congressmen, they don't... Uh, that's not usual for him. He actually shows up and does his work. Um, so, and that's a, a congressman that works hard. He just couldn't take the ruling. Um, I had dinner with him and Dr. Smith a couple of months later, and um, he was still down about it. You could see it in his eyes. You could see it in his face. But that was the feeling over all of the political right in Washington, D.C., and that moved all the way into this year, and it's still affecting um, the coalitions that we're working with today and um, in, in the congressmen and offices themselves. But when we work um, on our strategies, we've got a, a repeal coalition, and we exchange emails every single day. I think I've probably had 20 emails from the coalition today. Uh, and we worked on a bill last, uh, last month that was striking the um, slush fund that uh, Secretary Sebelius has been using and funding the high-risk pools. We have an email conversation that was eventually leaked to the public, but it was a 200 long, 200 long chain of us fighting between whether this uh, bite-sized reform would work or whether we need to hold out and work for full repeal. And while we fought about that, the Repub and then the conversation was leaked, the uh, coalition almost fell apart. We actually got to drink and come back together last week. but. Um, we can't decide on how, how we're going to do this. We're still in denial that Obamacare is the law. We're in denial that we need to figure out a way to move forward. Uh, as I said, the congressmen are unaware. And then when we look at the bills, uh, we support Congressman Brown's Options Act. The Options Act is going to be introduced again this year in almost the same fashion that it was last year with almost the same amount of, uh, it's a paltry amount of uh, co-signers. We're trying to work to get that up. And, um, but the House has passed, I think uh, uh, Dr. Iverson mentioned this, the House has passed 37 bills to repeal Obamacare in total or in part. And there's a, a small known fact, Obama has signed, I believe, four of those into law. And that's a partial repeal of the 1099 and a, a couple of other uh, little repeals, pulling back some of the slush fund. But we are having small wins, but uh, we need to do much more than just uh, passing full repeal bills on a bill that's not going to go anywhere past the House. So we need to uh, move on, and AAPS is doing that. Some of the senators and some of the congressmen are doing that. We have uh, Senator uh, Coburn is actually working on a national project. He's going out and talking to doctors from across the country on our side and seeing um, how the government is affecting them and their patients and how the government gets in between them and their patient in the, uh, in the room. As far as uh, AAPS is concerned, we're doing, uh, we're trying to host uh, briefings on Capitol Hill. Working with congressmen is, and uh, senators is never an easy thing, um, but eventually we're going to get the cats herded and um, get them into their place. We're uh, also working with um, some individual staffers up there that have uh, taken up our banner. And uh, I got a call uh, just yesterday. I've actually gotten two calls in the past two weeks, and I want to go back to the denial part a little bit and where some of the bright lines are. Um, I got a call that said, Charlie, are you alone? <laughs> I think I was sitting in the cafeteria, and you can usually lie about anything in DC. So I said, yes. And he said, I hear people in the background. I need you to actually be alone. And so I stepped out into the hallway. And I said, all right, I'm alone. And he said, I'm going to write a health care reform bill. And I was like, 
you're going to do what? I thought we wrote one last year. And he said, that wasn't anything. Now we're going to lay down the actual line. And I was like, well, you know I'll help you with that, right? And he said, I'm already a step ahead of you, but you know I can't let anybody else know about it. And I said, that's fine. It doesn't matter. We will lay down the right line, but it's interesting. The DC politics and the way that it works out, if he let anybody know that we were writing a bill, other associations would jump all over it. Other business interests would jump all over it. Other think tanks that claim to be aligned with us would jump all over it and pull him further and further and further towards a government-controlled, top-down system where the doctor can't take care of the patient and the patient can't actually see a doctor. So it was interesting, and I was like, I'll be with you. The code name's baseball. So I don't think you'll see us write anything about code name baseball, but when you see something come out from the Republican Study Committee, know that we had a hand in trying to hold it as far right as we can, and the staffer that's doing it is unbelievable. Um, I, I'll, 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 I'll tell people in person who the staffer is and uh, what's going on, but it really is a great project. Um, a refundable tax credit isn't far enough right for them, so we're uh, going to be doing some good um, good bills. I also got a story the other day. A, uh, a staffer from a freshman representative came into the office and said, um, we want you, uh, we, we're really interested in Medicare. We're interested in a bill to let patients opt out of Medicare. And there's a, there's a back story to it. Um, but the staffer goes, wow, that's interesting. Somebody talked to me about that the other day and I believe they're working on it. We actually have a bill that's at Ledge Council right now that's being written for, to let uh, patients and uh, let users opt out of Medicare so that um, they can actually take their money and do what they would like with it. Um, so the legislation, as I said, we're working on several ideas, but um, the real deal here is the invisible hand and that's letting the market work its way. When I'm on Capitol Hill, I tell the story of Dr. Smith's uh, surgery center in Oklahoma. Uh, when he first came up, he was excited that the, uh, hosp the local hospital had run an, a page advertisement that listed their prices in the local paper. They weren't as low as his, they weren't as inclusive, inclusive as his prices, but he was excited that they had done it. That was two years ago now. He's now, um, saving third-party payers. It was uh, 1.2 million so far this year that his surgery center saved. The last time he was on the Hill, he got six calls from Canadian patients while he was up with us. He's uh, currently not here. I believe he's talking to an employer group someplace and he's busy speaking to employer groups now until uh, I think he said I could have him in October uh, late sometime to get onto Capitol Hill. So this is the invisible hand working its way. I talked about uh, Dr. Uh, Madrigal Dersh's practice, and uh, my favorite part is uh, I, if uh, somebody in her practice, um, I hate talking in front of doctors and then using medical terms, so just let go with me for a second. But if somebody gets cancer, she treats them for free. If, uh, if she has a missionary in her district, she treats them for free unless they're Baptists, and then she charges them a nominal fee. And every time, that's a lie. She actually does treat them for free. But every time on Capitol Hill, you, you can't, they're like, really? And um, it's, uh, it's fun to see uh, when, you, when you back them off and say, no, silly, she treats them for free. And then you go and actually talk about her practice and what she's doing for her patients uh, and see their eyes open up. Uh, this is a fairly simple education process, but it is a long-term one. So the ends of these stories are fairly easy to see. Denial ends in failure, all right? Education ends in knowledge, and the invisible hand will guide the way. But even if we're far down the road and if we don't have the education, to back up what everybody in this room is doing. If they don't have the education on Capitol Hill to see what's actually happening in the market, it's not going to go any place. If the Democrats left Capitol Hill today, the Republicans still wouldn't know what bill to pass. And we are trying to take care of that and taking care of 
the Republicans and then moving and taking care of the Democrats. It's going to be a hard road. I'm going to get out of the way here. If you have any questions, I need your stories. I need your questions. I need your thoughts. Tell me about your practices and what you do, and I'm happy to take that to any office on Capitol Hill. Simple question, uh, Chuck. Uh, Charlie, I guess. Huh? Yep. Uh, given the fact that the exchanges, the national exchanges, had not been funded in the original legislation, why doesn't the House simply not fund them? Simple thing to do. Don't appropriate the money that wasn't appropriated for the, the legislation in the first place. Uh, it's a simple thing to do, but it's not a simple thing to do. Uh, I, I would need to look at the direct legislation. I mean, I think Andy has a, uh, had, had a lawsuit, had a, uh, a case idea earlier that was um, about the origination clause. And I mean, that's a simple idea too. They, they don't actually use what's in law to uh, act on Capitol Hill. So, I mean, yes, it's a simple idea. Um, yes, it should work that way. I don't believe that that's actually how it's going to work. Secretary Sebelius is, is actually raising money from private funds, which may be you know, against the law. There's multiple reasons why her raising, uh, raising funds is against the law. And I mean, that's just one of the many scandals that uh, the president ran into last week. Uh, they. To, to let her raise money, um, there's, uh, I think that there was three or four different laws that she ran into as a problem of raising money. But one of the laws, the, uh, they were able to deflect by saying she wasn't raising money under her professional capacity or under her uh, as secretary, but that ran her into all the other laws head, headlong. So, uh, I mean, they're, it, they're in damage control all over right now. Well, we take one more question, then we'll go for uh, great presentation. Um, how do you deal with the fact that the staffers are continually changing for the key congressmen and senators? I, I personally have had experience dealing with Congress on uh, matters of the defects and flaws and the uh, uh, other matters pertaining to electronic health records. And it seems like as soon as you get a group educated, they're gone. Uh, so you know, from the education component of your presentation, how do you deal with the fact that there's a revolving door where, you know, aides are there maybe for a year or two and then they're gone? And we're talking about the top health LAs and, and other yeah. key folks. So uh, for those of you who don't know, our nation's run by 28-year-olds that are uh, underpaid and overworked. And they're not underpaid. They're, they will work at their wage, so, but they don't get paid much. They're living in Washington, D.C. They're getting paid around $30,000. That means they have to live in a house of six. They work something like 70, 80, 90 hour weeks. I know that I didn't get a weekend off until I was a year, a little over a year into working on Capitol Hill. Um, and at the time I was getting paid 26 five. So, um, that is who you're dealing with. And so you're correct, there is a, there is a high turnover. Um, but A, those people don't usually leave and go home. Most of them leave and do something in Washington, DC. And B, we've identified on every single issue, there might be uh, 90 staffers, but there, there's one to two really good ones. And those one to two really good ones don't usually go away. So you identify the good staffers, you educate them, you build up your, your power base with the other guys who might leave you to influence the good staffers, and then they move on to the committee. And so, and on the committee, you move into a whole different group of people. The average age on a committee is more like 48, and they're more highly paid and more likely to stay around. And then the corollary is then the senators and congressmen are always changing committees also. So once you get someone like Senator Grassley was on Senate Finance, and then he moved over to Judiciary, and, and his Correct. purview was completely different. So I was, a, uh, I was a Chuck Grassley staffer. So that is a, a partially correct and partially incorrect statement. He has uh, uh, several different staffers that uh, Chris Conlon uh, is currently on the Finance Committee. He was an intern while I was in uh, Chuck Grassley's office. He's still on the Finance Committee today. Uh, Nick Corellis is over there. Um, a bunch of the people, the staffers, when they're on the committee, 
tend to stick around the committee. They're, they're all very old timers uh, that understand the law and understand what's going on. And that is especially true in the Senate. Thank you. Thanks, Charlie. <clears throat>